My mind, at least, is more synonymous with aspect-oriented programming, although there are several other people in the audience who could uh, come close to that title if, uh, if I'm wrong. Uh, in any case, I uh, invited him here today because I think that aspect-oriented programming is uh, uh, part of the future of programming, and I think that uh, at Google we always want to have our eye on the future, as it were. So uh, without taking up too much more of your time, uh, here he is. Hi, yeah, I think that's an overly generous introduction. John Lamping's here. Without John Lamping, none of the Park AOP work would have happened. So um, it's hard to give this talk because he could correct me on <laughs> most slides. Um, you know, I wasn't quite sure how to set this talk up. Um, I, have, I have some slides that are fairly nuts and bolts about what you can do today with aspect-oriented programming. I have some slides that are fairly conceptual about how I think about aspect-oriented programming in terms of opening up a new space of language research. Uh, the nuts and bolts slides are blue and the other slides are yellow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the blue slides and I'm going to count on you to interrupt me and ask questions and we'll see where we go. Um, I figured dynamically adapting to the audience was better than my guessing what the audience would be. Um, so what I want to try to talk about is what AOP is, how it works, what it means to really think aspects when you're designing a system, um, and again, the, this set of slides is fairly practical. Um, and in this set of slides, three themes, three cross-cutting themes that I want to be looking at are expressiveness, abstraction, and structure and modularity, whichever you prefer, whichever word you prefer to use for that concept. So just to start, imagine you know, a simple drawing tool, JHotDraw. Some of you have seen this example before countless times, I apologize. Um, and imagine sort of trying to think about the design for that. And you probably start thinking in terms of objects, and you start thinking in terms of maybe points and lines. And if you think about it for a while, you maybe even come up with a piece of UML that looks something like this, or if you don't believe in UML, you can just use a napkin. Um, you got a display, there's different kinds of shapes, points and lines, and there's other kinds of shapes, dot, dot, dot. And if you think in terms of expressiveness, abstraction, and structure, and modularity, this this little piece of code and design does pretty well. Kind of how it works is pretty clear. Abstraction's working pretty well for you. You could sort of look at point at this level of abstraction or that level of abstraction. The structure and modularity are pretty good. If you want to change something about how point works, you kind of know where to go. If you want to add a new kind of shape, like maybe a triangle, you kind of know where to go. Now, it would be sort of sad if in 2006 a piece of code this simple was confusing, but let's just say that a piece of code this simple is not confusing. The thing is that even in 2006, or at least in 1995, with that simple piece of code, there were some things that were confusing. So imagine just taking an observer pattern and putting it in that piece of code. Right, the role that the observer pattern has to play in this piece of code is that every time one of these shapes changes, somebody has to let the display know to refresh itself. And we sort of say that doesn't fit. One way to think about that is, now that we have the word observer pattern, we had what I would like to think of as, as, as sort of fair design quality. Because you could sort of say, well, there's this nice thing and there's an observer pattern. But we didn't have great code quality because you sort of say, well, there's this nice thing and then there's an observer pattern. And if somebody says to you, well, where is it? You say, well, it's kind of all over. Right? So what AOP is about is it's about making things like observer pattern, which we'll call cross-cutting concerns. And I'll try to give you a couple of different definitions of that term. It's about making them fit in the sense that at sort of a design level, you can kind of say there's a single thing, the observer pattern. And at the code level, you can kind of say a single thing, this is the observer pattern. And you'll have the kinds of expressiveness and abstraction and modularity that we like. And I've got this code grayed out because you're not supposed to try to read it now, although I know the kind of people you are and all of you are. Um, and if this works, then you kind of get that good design quality and good code quality back. 
This just shows that there's another way of coding it. And I've got this point here just to, just to point out that already you could sort of see that there's something here that's not quite like objects or quite like procedures. Because you know you can't name a single class observer pattern. I mean, obviously you can, right? But you can name the class observer pattern, but then there's nothing really to put in it that implements the observer pattern for the entire application. So in some sense, this, the, you know, the 10,000-foot the, 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 the version of this is that today, most any programmer looks at J hot draw and kind of immediately sees this picture. And the interesting thing is that most AOP programmers, a guy like, like Nick, whose mind is now permanently damaged, um, immediately see a different picture. Just as immediately as you might see points and lines, they see these other kinds of modular units of cross-cutting functionality, the observer pattern, and some other examples that we'll look at. And of course, there's tons and tons of other examples. Security, optimization, distribution, dot, 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 dot. And of course, logging, which even though everybody's tired of it, turns out to be a more interesting example than you think. Um, and I'll talk about some of those. So that was kind of the blast introduction. Remember, you're supposed to be asking questions and interrupting me and not letting me get away with anything. I'm counting on this audience to do that. Um, the way the rest of the blue slide deck works is I'm going to use Aspect J. Aspect J is sort of the de facto standard for AOP in, in, certainly in Java and in some sense in other general purpose languages as well. It just kind of says, look, here's what a thing would be. Uh, it's not the only one. It's not the only one for Java. It's not the only one for other languages. But if you look at Aspect J first, you kind of get the general idea. So we're going to use that one. We'll look at, this is a peek ahead. This, the really underlying central concept in AOP is this notion of join point models. And we'll see that Aspect J has two of them. And the way the blue slide deck works is I re-implement the observer pattern over and over and over again. And then after you've seen more of those than you could stand, I'll show you some other examples. And I'll do a tool demonstration to show you what it's like to program with this um, and just kind of talk about how it works. So let me start getting into some of the Aspect J concepts. I walk a lot and you've got long legs. So <laughs> I'll try not to step on you. Um, so the first concept in Aspect J is a thing called a method execution join point. And one way of understanding it is using this um, sequence diagram. The method execution join points correspond to the execution of methods in the runtime call graph. So this is a method execution join point, and this is a method execution join point. And these are method execution join points. And an interesting thing you can see is that the same method, of course, might execute multiple times, but those are two different join points, right? So method execution join points are what Aspect J calls dynamic join points. And Aspect J has 11 kinds of them, method execution, constructor execution. It also has method call, right? So the execution happens here on the call, called object, and the call join point happens here on the calling object. And there's field get and set. And for this talk, you don't need to know them all, but there's a bunch of them. So that's not really a thing that Aspect J adds to Java. That's a thing that was already there, but Aspect J is giving it a name. Here's the thing that Aspect J adds to Java. So it's the first sort of explicit piece of language. It's called a point cut. And what a point cut is, roughly speaking, is it's a predicate that matches some join points. Right, because a running Aspect J program is going to have billions and billions of join points all the time. This point cut matches only certain ones. In particular, it matches join points that are method executions and are executions of this particular method. So that matches every join point where the set P1 method's running. Because they're predicates, you can compose them. So this is a compound point cut that matches any join point that is either an execution of set P1 or an execution of set P2. Now, there's a bunch of primitive point cuts. I'm going to give you a quick peek now and talk about some more later. Um, there's two basic families of them. There's kinded primitive point cuts and non-kinded primitive point cuts. And the kinded point cuts match join points of only a particular kind, like an execution join point, or a call join point, or a field get join point. 
And the non-kind of join points match join points of any kind, but they match them based on some other kind of property. Like this one happens to match any join point that, for which the corresponding text is within a certain type. And so for those of you who might be getting bored at this point, you could start to think about that the power in this thing comes from a compositional language and different ways of talking about the same join point. And those kinds of compositions let you say some very interesting things that we'll see in a minute. John, what do I have to do to get them to ask questions? Ordinarily nothing. Okay, I got one. I'm going to give you a concrete example, yes. The question was about understanding what point cuts are and hoping there would be a concrete example, such as this one. Yes? So is it, would it be true to say that what you've defined so far as a language for matching uh, patterns on the call stack or on the call tree graph? The question is, would it be true to say that what I've defined so far is a language for matching patterns on the call stack. I'm going to say yes with a star. The reason I'm going to put the star on it is that what you mean to say is probably the right thing, but you're saying it in very implementation specific terms. And we worked pretty hard to divorce it from implementation specific terms. So that's what the star is about. Let me get to the concrete example. Uh, so I showed you that I could take two primitive point cuts and compose them. What I'm doing here is I'm giving a composition a name. As an aside here, Abelson and Sussman say that you have a language when you have primitives, a means of composition, and a means of abstraction. What's really going on here is there's a little mini sub-language here for point cuts. Because I have primitives, I can compose them, and I can abstract over the composition. So I'm building the example. Now that, I, now that he's asking questions again. So can you explain in English what that point cut is saying? Okay. I'm going to say some more about it. But what I'm going to say is I have a user-defined point cut called change. And the implementation of that point cut is that it matches any join point, which is either an execution of the set P1 method or an execution of the set P2 method. If you'd like, it matches both set P1 and set P2 methods, right? Because of the way predicates compose. Hold, hold on just a second. Let me just get to the example. I, I'm very glad about the questions. I'm still trying to answer his. I'll just show you two pieces more code, and then I'll I'll take a, a good question pause. So here's one construct, point cuts. Here's another construct. This is a thing called after returning advice. And what this says is it's another declaration. It says after returning from any join point matched by this point cut, I run this code. So you can sort of think about it as I'm bombing along. I hit a join point that the point cut matches, and on the way back out, I run this code. And so now here's your first concrete example. This is an aspect called observer pattern, or maybe it should be called my observer pattern. And it says, here's this observer pattern aspect of the system. And some points in the system's execution are going to represent what I call a change. And if you want to know which points it is, well, it's these points here. And after returning from any such chain, any such join point, after returning from a change, update the display. So there's a concrete example. And what's important is the way I want you to read it. So let me now, I push somebody's question aside. I think it was yours. I'm just wondering about the name, the point. You know, one man's point is another man's. It's a node in the call graph. So in that sense, it's a point. Right? Part oh, uh, 
he's wondering about why we're calling them join points, because in some sense, they represent a range of time. Um, and, and that's right. Uh, the reason we're calling them join points is when you take the broader perspective of AOP in general, you want to be able to think of all these different kinds of aspect mechanisms. And they're not all range-like. They're more like join points. So join point turns out to be a better name in general. But the intuition behind your question is exactly right. A point that's always something that can be returned. Um, you, you can say, some, can you define some point that, that does not correspond to any code, I mean, code sequence? After returning, assume the point that cut is somewhere in the core graph. Right. I think I understand your question. The question is, does every point cut have the property that you could do after returning on it? <coughs> Modulo a minor issue that has to do with the difference between, with one of the few differences between the JLS and the JVM. The answer is yes. yes. So there's a slight way in which what I'm saying is wrong, but I'm going to explain the real point. The real point is that there's three concepts here. There's join points, which are points in the call graph. There's point cuts, which match join points. And there's several different kinds of advice. And modulo this little detail. The three are orthogonal, meaning you could put any kind of advice on any kind of point cut. In, or you could put any kind of advice on any kind of join point. So every join point has the property that it has a notion of returning, unless it throws an exception, in which case it doesn't return. But every join point has a property of you come to it, you do it, and you leave. So the answer to your question is yes. This will be something that I should probably ask later uh, after I've seen this slide. Is there any way to, uh, to, have, to have the, for example, the after uh, block know the state? We're coming to that. Okay. So, this is an interactive other language features in particular inheritance. We're coming to that. Okay. <laughs> I just had a question about the syntax. Is uh, after the after advice, is it after the keyword, or is it the name of your returning action? After is the keyword. Uh, in Aspect J, these advice are unnamed. In some other AOP languages, they're named. And there's a little bit of, well, it's not a little bit, there's some debate about which of those is the least bad idea. <laughs> As an implementation of observer, this seems very static. It doesn't capture the kind of register. We're coming to that. <laughs> <laughs> And um, why is it blue? Bad slide typing. I'm going to take one more that we're coming to. If either of these is one we're coming to, I'm going to go a bit farther. Yeah. So it seems that um, this is a particular choice of decomposing the different aspects, and there's still a kind of dominating aspect of one that's not so important. Like, um, can you elaborate on how you would, why you would take the, um, like one of the aspects out that you would send to the regular class, and then the other as an aspect? Right, so there's a big, there's a big, the, the question has to do with, and he's using some of the terminology that, that, that this research community uses, uh, and pointing out that there's still sort of a dominant, what, what, what the research community calls a dominant decomposition, in that some parts of the code are done with classes, and some parts of the code are done with aspects. And how did you decide? This was something that, that we used to talk about a lot. We, we called it strong AOP and weak AOP, right? Is there a world in which kind of everything is sort of aspects and waiting to register with something else? Or is this more aspect J model of there's classes and then there's cross-cutting aspects, the way to think about it? I personally have come to believe two things, one strongly and one a little less strongly which is that in terms of the adoption of this technology for the near-term future, which is to say the next five to 10 years, uh, this model, this, this so-called asymmetric model, is the way to go. Um, because most people have big systems already, 
and those systems build on very large infrastructure libraries. And so there is this sort of dominant decomposition out there that you've got to work with. I believe that pretty strongly. I think I also believe that even if you rebuilt the world, the quote right way to go would be to have block structure as your primary composition, as your primary structuring modularity, hierarchy as your secondary structuring modularity, and cross-cutting as the third. I don't think that a world in which everything is cross-cutting to start with is going to be a simpler world to work with. Even though it's quite clear that the, the primitive mechanism of join points could do that, I don't think you would I think you would find that world much more interesting than this world, but I don't think you would find it easier to work in. That's, but, but that's unproven, and there are, there are other people in this field who disagree with me about that point. Uh, the first point, which is an adoption point, I feel pretty strongly about. I'm going to go a bit. Sorry. Sorry. A quick point I want to make here is the way I read this to you is the way I want you to think about it. It's a declarative semantics. This slide here is what you would write without aspect J. The single most common first mistake in understanding AOP is to think about the semantics of this as meaning this. And that gets you into sort of this program transformation oriented semantics. And the, the reason people make that mistake is, of course, the first implementations of this were transformation oriented. And then people don't distinguish you know, the, the implementation from the idea. Right? Uh, the better way to think about it is in this declarative way. And then how it works behind the scenes, who knows? It may be that a compiler does something like this. It may be that an aspect oriented virtual machine never does anything quite like this. And I probably don't need to belabor this point here. Uh, if I had to belabor it, I would just point out to you that in today, in 2006, most people think about objects like this. Unless they're trying to answer certain kinds of critical performance questions, they don't tend to think about objects like this. Right? Now, you know, when the world first started learning about, you know, the third time objects were invented in the mid-80s. People talked a lot about dispatch tables and dot, 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 right? But you know, Kristen's group and, and Alan's group never talked about that. They always talked about it at this higher level. I just think that's the way to think about that idea scales. You can't do object-oriented design if you're thinking about dispatch vectors. Right? You can think about critical performance issues that way. And I'm going to claim that the right way to think about aspects is to think about them in a declarative unit. And now if you want to ask, answer, ask a performance question, well, think about what the actual machine instructions are. But don't make that the only way you have of thinking about the idea. I won't belabor that point anymore here. I'll pause again in just a second. Point cuts, of course, don't have to be restricted to one class. I could build them up more and more and more. And here's a revised version of the observer pattern, which is now really capturing most of the observer pattern behavior for this application. I'll pause here for a second. Yeah. Is your question still? So what I'm confused about is in the effort to make this more modular by grafting on these uh, aspects, I mean, I use the wrong term. Anyway. <laughs> that it looks like the program has gotten less modular because now any kind of refactoring you do to uh, point, line, and shape, and in the implementation type decisions you make to change there uh, are going to break all these aspects that are not visible in there and not even in line. Right. <clears throat> How do I say this? You might think that. <laughs> The, hi. Um, what he's saying is, in the effort to make the program more modular, it seems that in some ways it may have become less modular. Because now, if I go refactor like the pointer line class, where I make some edits to it, I might break how the observer pattern works. <laughs> 
I'll come back to this a little bit more, particularly when I show you the tool thing. Let me point something out to you. Imagine that the program is only a little bit bigger, like there's only 30 such shape classes, okay? And that those 30 such shape classes are part of a system in which there's only 5,000 classes. And imagine that in that program where there's only 5,000 classes, there's only 250 of these things going on. Okay, so we're talking about a small program. In that small program, the likelihood that you would be able, and, and I, there's a couple papers, I, I have a paper, but other people have papers that, that make this argument in detail. But the likelihood that you would necessarily be able to go and make a so-called local edit to here without in some way screwing up this cross-cutting functionality, without having to go read a lot of code, very small. And I'm going to argue that yes, it may be that changes you have to make will break this aspect. But because the aspect is now captured in a declarative way that has a well-defined interface, the tools are going to help you not screw up. Whereas previously, you were completely on your own to not screw up. That's going to form of the argument going to be. Because that's the only thing that modularity technology can ever do for you. It can't solve the problem that changing this might change that. All it can do is give you declarative interfaces that you can get some kind of automated support for reasoning about, did the thing I do here cause me to have to go look here? And I'm going to argue that the aspect version of the code does better on that hands down. Okay? And what you've got to hold me to is whether I make that case. Thankfully, I've only got 30 more minutes, and then you're all out of the room. <laughs> So wouldn't it make sense for us to go into the mindset we want to, I mean, I totally agree that declarative is better, right? But if we go into the line we want to be two methods, and we put an annotation of it and say this method right. changes the... So it's a whole bad thought. <laughs> I'm going to come to that slide. Um, I'm going to... This is very good. There's lots of questions now. <laughs> what was I thinking when I said that? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't understand your answer to it. This question, uh, I mean, I could uh, easily add a new method to uh, the parameter line without breaking any existing code, but uh, that it would break the aspects. Right. Yeah. And what I'm going to claim is that the corresponding change in the AOP version of the code versus the non AOP version of the code, in the AOP version of the code, you're going to have better support for making the change correctly. I, I, I don't believe that, but maybe you'll get to it. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep going. Now I've dug myself a hole, which I need time to dig out of. Uh, there's other ways to write this in AspectJ and all other AOP tools. AspectJ has a very, very restricted pattern matching language that would let you write this piece of code. Any subtype of shape, any method that starts with set that takes one argument of any type. There's some question, a lot of question, as to, to what degree you should feel comfortable writing those kinds of wild cards. Most people believe that in Java code, where <coughs> the naming convention for setters is highly enforced, that's a reasonable one to write. But we'll talk some more about that. Here's the attribute question. Who was that? That was yours. So now that C Sharp and Java have reinvented syntactic flexibility, uh, you could also do this with annotations. <coughs> you could tag these things as changes, and then your point cut would get to be simpler. Your point cut would just be, well, anything that's tagged with a change, do this. Makes a lot of sense to me. Right. What if, say, there's only 5,000 of these places? What if there are 50,000 of them? Right. What if there's 50,000? What if? I'm asking, what if? <laughs> 50,000 50, points where you are explicitly declaring them to, to have a specific behavior. So if you ever go into that code and you figure, oh, I did something that actually now doesn't actually change the line, I can remove the annotation for this specific method without having to look for all the classes that try to figure out whether this method is making right. a change into its internal. So part of the answer here is going to be tool support. 
here's the best practice that's emerging. The best practice that's emerging is if there's a small number of places and the annotation tells you something that's true about this code. Notice that the name of the annotation here has nothing to do with the observer pattern. Yes. If both of those things are true, then use an annotation and write advice like that. If either of those things is not true, in other words, there's a lot of places, or what matters here is not really true of the code, but is true of some particular context the code runs in, then you write these more what are called oblivious point cuts. That's a, that's, that's a term that, that Bob invented, having to do with sort of writing, a, writing point cuts in a way that this code has no explicit marker for. And I think there's some pretty good arguments for doing it that way. I'm going to show you that tool support gives you a little bit of the best of both worlds. Who asked about values? It was somebody here. Somebody said, can you get the values of the thing? So I, I'm not going to explain how this works in detail. But this, <coughs> that point cut uses the special this point cut primitive for getting access to the object which is executing. In other words, the shape that's changing. And picks it up down here. And so I can write this advice here where I actually know which shape is changing. And there's a couple other such primitives. There's one called target, which at a call join point gives you the thing being called. And there's one called args, which gives you the arguments to the method. And those let you get some of the values that are going around at the call in question. And those can be used in useful ways. Now, somebody right in here said that I didn't have the behavior of adding and removing the observers and stuff like that. That was yours. So here's a revised version that uses what I said was going to be called the second join point model in Aspect J. The way to read this code is that's a field declaration, right? It says there's a private field of type display called display. What that shape dot means is it means that the field is associated with shapes. That particular one means anything of type shape. You could write something else if you wanted. You could have written just point there. But in this particular code, I wrote shape. But it, it globally affects all, sh all shapes, so there's nothing you can do to. It affects the type shape and all of its subtypes. It's not global at all. It follows the type hierarchy. Okay? It's the type shape. And this method here is a setter that sets it. I'm headed for the full-on pattern with add observer and remove observer, but I'm taking one step at a time. And now down here, instead of doing a static display update, I update just the display in question. The interesting thing is notice this private here. This private is a funny thing. It says, it says the field lives on shape, but shape doesn't see it. Only the observer pattern aspect sees it. It's, it's a property of the shapes, but it's private to the observer pattern. This is a wonderful thing, actually. It replaces this piece of code that you're used to writing, which is when you go and stick a field in an object and a getter method and a setter method for it, and then there's a comment that says, actually, this is only here for the benefit of that guy over there. Right? This piece of code basically says that declaratively. It says, you know, there's a property of these objects that really belongs to the observer pattern. Yeah. Aspect has its own namespace, so can um, Question is, do the aspects have their own namespace so that they can avoid name conflicts? The answer is, the answer, I mean, the simple answer is yes. Because this field is private, another aspect could have a private field of the same name. And in fact, shape could have a private field of the same name. And all three fields would be separate. If the aspect had defined a public field, and the class had a public field, then that would be a name conflict. Because in that case, really, the semantics of your program is in conflict. Right? Yeah? Is there a way to attach uh, aspects to common classes uh, in a non-global way? That is, uh, <coughs> I want to uh, attach some aspects to cache tables or arrays, but only some of them. I, I don't want to affect every one of them in the program. There is. And I'm not going to talk about that. 
Uh, the question is, is there a way to sort of attach the state properties of aspects, to define the state properties of aspects to objects in a particular context? And the answer is yes, but it's more hair than I'm going to get to. Uh, but we can talk about it after. Uh, but not arrays. We don't do arrays. That's not a property of AOP. That's a property of the current version of Aspect J. In Java, it's sort of, it's arguable as to whether it does make sense to do it for arrays. So, uh, I can have different types of shapes, which all set X and set Y. Uh, so I can have an angle and a square. Is there a notion of context in which something is called, or do I have to describe a change for a triangle and a square definition? I'm not sure. You could have different kinds of shapes. So for example, a sh triangle could have a set X and set Y method. I got that part of it. So I have a point has set X and set Y. And point is called a whole triangle and square. But the behavior I have for set X and set Y is different after it's called from triangle versus square. Is, this, is there a notion of context in which something is called? Or is it only the target that Yes, I, OK, good. I understand your question. The question is, <clears throat> suppose that there's a case where if I call set x from over here, I want to do one thing. But if I call set x from over here, I want to do something else. And in fact, that's, that's exactly the kind of thing. Remember the comment I made about the two kinds of point cuts and that the game was going to be composing them? That's exactly what that's going to let me do. Hang on a second, and I'll show you. I'll do one more now, yeah. So uh, one thing that happens when you write this pattern normally is you get a lot of too many updates, right? Does, uh, does Aspect Chase solve that problem? Three slides. Uh, and, and there's a follow-up also within the Aspect itself. Can you get circularity? Yes. Okay. Uh, the follow-up question was, within the Aspect itself, can you get circularity? And the answer is yes, right? Aspect J has. There's the canonical way of writing infinite recursion in Aspect J. Right? You write a piece of advice that actually applies to the advice. And stack, you get stack overflow. You do that three times, and then you never do it again. It's, it's kind of like learning infinite recursion when, when you're learning recursion the first time. Um, I'm going to have to pick up a little, little speed. Um, I won't do this slide. I will do this slide, because there's something to think about what's happened to the structure of your system here. And one way to look at it is in terms of refers to relationships. In the original plain Java code, the line of code that was going to associate a display with a shape looked like that. And the refers to relationships are that that line of code refers to both display and shape. And moreover, shape and display refer to each other. Because shape knows it has a field of type display, and display knows that it has a list of shapes. Right? And so of course, whenever you have a cycle in your refers to graph, you have something that can't be shipped in any meaningful configuration without the other thing. Right? So from a product line perspective, cycles in the refers to graph, potentially problem. What happens in the, in the Aspect J implementations is that you, get, you basically get rid of shape knowing about displays by moving all of that into the observer pattern. And what that means you could do is you could ship shapes with this observer pattern and this display. Or you could ship shapes with no display at all. Or you could ship them with some other observer pattern and some other display. Because you've sort of separated the core functionality of the things from the presentation layer in this particular example. TV, I wasn't sure. TV has this wonderful thing, this Emacs that reads to him, that works exactly this way. Right? He's got advice defined on the Emacs that basically preempts, it doesn't preempt, it adds to the normal presentation layer a second presentation layer. And it works exactly this way. Well, the original one is text. No, no. What, what's the one? I skipped the slide that let me make this more nuanced point because I was running out of time. It's this slide. It's 
the big shift happens here. And then a little bit more shift happens here. I, I don't want to talk about that right now. So I said before the key idea was join point models. I just go up one level of abstraction a little bit and say that join point models basically have three parts. There's the join points, there's a means of identifying join points, and there's a means of affecting the semantics at join points. There's a typo there. So the first thing I showed you, point cuts and advice, the join points were nodes in the dynamic call graph. The point cuts were the means of identifying them, and the advice was the means of affecting them. And the second thing I showed you, the inner type declarations, the join points are the member declarations. There's a language of patterns that I didn't show you for identifying them, and you can define the member. Aspect J calls these the dynamic join point model and the static join point model. Because this basically has dynamic semantics and this has static semantics. Because by defining a new member on something, you really change the type. Okay? This is a bit more subtle a point, but if you want to start thinking about making your own AOP language for your own custom thing, the reason I put this slide here is, is to start to make the move towards the, the higher level of abstraction of which aspect J is just one particular instance. I'll talk a couple minutes about this. The AOP community talks about this notion of cross-cutting structure and says, well, you know, way back in the day we had block structure and then came hierarchical structure and here's this new kind of structure called cross-cutting structure. And we're still sort of struggling over exactly what that means and how to think about it, right? It's an, intu it's an intuition thing. Um, I'll give you a couple different ways of thinking about it. One way of thinking about it is this which is that you've got a dominant decomposition and you walk up to it and you use constructs like point cuts and inner type declarations to slice a new interface through it and then you program against that interface. That's one way of thinking about it. I'm going to give you three. Another way of thinking about it is that you have these different decompositions and in some sense the aspect, the whole aspect kind of slices through those. Those two are quite similar. In some sense, the, the intellectually most precise definition is this one, which is to say that two concerns, the primary functionality here and the aspect functionality here, cross-cut each other with respect to a common representation if and only if the projections onto the common representations overlap but don't subsume each other. Sounds real good. <laughs> it's what's going on here, right? The projection of the red stuff into here overlaps both blue and black, but nothing contains everything else. Right? So there's not, hierarchical structure can't help you with this problem. Because in order for hierarchical structure to help you with the problem, it would have to be that some things subsumes everything else. Right? So this is cross-cutting structure. Personally, intellectually, I think this is a, po a powerful way of thinking about it. In terms of programming, I think this is currently the most useful way of thinking about it. Hang on. And this is the way that some of the people who are getting the most power out of this technology are thinking about it, which is they say, you know, here's a big thing. And the interface that I want isn't there but it really ought to be there. It makes good sense. So I'm going to cause it to be there, and then I'm going to program against it. And you have these consultants that are going into places and saying, oh yeah, you can't figure out what your J2E application is doing. Five minutes later, they're telling you interesting things about it. And the reason is that they're not bothering to sort of say, well, I have to go live in that code. They're saying, I've got a library of point cuts that gives me a meaningful abstraction of that code. I can just cut through it, program against those point cuts, and know interesting things right away. So I think that from the power perspective, this is the most useful way of thinking about the intuition of cross-cutting. I think that from the sort of intellectual perspective, this is the underlying thing that's going on. And I could say much more about this than this, but I'm going to leave it at that. I cut off somebody else. 
over here, I think. I didn't. I didn't cut off anybody this time. I was wondering if uh, any of the IDE plugins for AFP have this kind of visualization. So I'm going to come to that. So let me do the IDE demo. And this is going to address a lot of the kinds of questions that people are asking. Go ahead. This doesn't break encapsulation in any way if you want to cross There are people who say that it does. They're wrong. <laughs> no, it's, it's a point of debate. It comes all the way back to his question. Right? So I will argue, and, and I think I have a very clear and convincing argument, that the old story about encapsulation was a lie. <laughs> and it was a lie for the following simple reason, which is that in the old story, you said, right, you stood there and in all honesty, you said, line has an interface and point has an interface. And the interface, you've heard this, you know, imagine that I'm Barbara Liskoff or something. And the interface described the functionality of the thing. Where in the interface does it talk about the call to display.update? Nowhere. What happens with the call to display that update is that some programmer who doesn't own the line class or the point class checks them out of CVS in the middle of the night and adds this stuff all through them and then checks them back in. And it's not documented anywhere because there is no high ground on which to stand to do it. So what's happening is that social practice is very clearly at conflict with the story that we tell about encapsulation. And I sort of believe, and this is one of the things I got from you know, years at Park, is you really ought to check the story about your technology against what the users are actually doing. And if you did that with integrity, you would realize that the current story we tell about modularity is bunk. Okay, but the observer pattern fixed that. No, it didn't. It didn't. The observer pattern gave a name yes. that you could, if you chose to, put on the comment at each of the 47 places that you did it. <laughs> so it almost fixed it. Well, it, gave you hope to do. it gave you a concept. But hang on. Let me show you this. So a thing, what do I want to look at first here? This two microphones thing is a problem. Um, so a question that nobody actually asked this time, but many of you were thinking is, you know, how do I understand how my code is working, da 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 da. I'm sitting here looking at SETX, and I don't know there's this advice. And that's exactly the same problem as I'm sitting here looking at SETX, and I don't know whether it's a method that overrides an inherited method. In other words, the modularity technology objects has given me something that I don't understand necessarily. And the way the IDEs solve that problem these days is that they put a note. They say, well, I've read your whole program, and I understand its declarative structure. And there's a little note. And that's what happens here. This note says, oh, this is advised. And in fact, it's advised by two things. It's advised by a tracing aspect and a display updating aspect. And I can go look at that display updating aspect. And I could basically navigate that cross-cutting structure. So what's happening here is that because I made the cross-cutting structure declarative, the tool can show it to me. And it can show it to me in different ways. Here's another way it can show it to me. What I've got here, and this is just a very small system. But what I've got here is a, a this, this system has two aspects in it. And what this is showing me is for each of these classes where the two aspects affect. So if I had, say, 50 aspects, and I wanted to see about the interaction of two of them, I could unselect all but two of these aspects, just select the two that I want to understand the interaction of, and really zero in on that and try to understand that behavior. When you have multiple aspects, which one goes first? The language has well-defined rules for that. And there's several mechanisms for controlling it. Um, So the point here is modularity always has a cost. And the cost it has is that, in some sense, you get an indirection. And it's only worth paying the cost 
if you get something back. And what you're getting back here is a couple things. One thing you're getting back is sort of the raw, the raw benefit of modularity, which is in some sense, I could ship point without display updating. And this <laughs> tiny program doesn't matter much. But I could ship point without display updating. But you ought to get a second thing back from modularity, which is that you ought to get a, an ability to reason about the structure now. And I will argue that we're giving you this in a much better way than you could possibly have had before. Because before, what you would have done is you would have done, let's see, let me see if I can get this right. You would have taken grep, and you would have grepped against the files. And then what's the name of the thing that gives you the 10 lines before and the 10 lines after? Minus yeah. B, what? Minus B and minus A. Yeah, minus B. This guy's, got, this guy's done this a thousand times. You've taken the minus B and minus A thing, and then you would have grepped that against some second string. And only the places that matched both of them were the places where these two things applied, provided, of course, that nobody changed the names of any meaningless variables that caused your grep string to break. Everything that's right about that is righter about this. We're giving you a compositional language for reasoning about that kind of structure. I'm going to run massively out of time. So I'm, I'm not going to take any more questions. But I'll be here the rest of the day until I escape. Um, <laughs> I just want to show you some other examples quickly. I'm skipping this part. I'm skipping, 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 skip. I did this, did this. Here's some more examples. Who asked about the too many updates? <laughs> OK, this solves the too many updates thing. <laughs> It solves it by saying, well, a change, and then here's another primitive point cut. It's called C flow below. And this point cut matches any joint point, which is in the control flow of any joint point matched by this point cut. So this is an aspect J idiom that says the top level foo. Here you're starting to see what it's like to be able to program with compositional cross-cutting structure. Because you've got this notion of change, which cross-cuts statically, and you've got this control flow, which cross-cuts dynamically, and you intersect those two things. And the thing you're trying to say, very simple to say. It's very dangerous if you have that display within a display. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's exactly dangerous as any other way of solving the problem. <laughs> um, here's another nice one. We actually didn't know Aspect J would do this for us until quite late in the project. Uh, this code has a factory pattern in it. The factory pattern says that you're never supposed to call the constructors of these directly. You're supposed to call the factory. That's unenforceable with Java. Um, but it's enforceable with Aspect J because it has cross-cutting structure. You say, well, a new shape is a call to a constructor on shape. I'm in a factory if here's a point cut I haven't shown you, but this just says I'm inside of a method called make star on shape. And it's a bad thing if there's a new shape that's not in a factory. And this says, if I do a bad thing, I should complain. And this is so useful that you'd actually like to get these warnings at compile time, because this is, this is what's called a static point cut. And so Aspect J has a very special kind of compile time advice called declare error, which roughly speaking says, if such a join point exists, complain at compile time. One of the classic adoption strategies for, for Aspect J in general, and AOP in particular, is to start by doing architecture enforcement. You don't write any aspects that ship in the running product. Um, you start by doing architecture enforcement because you reduce your risk. Let me go more quickly. Oh, here's the full-on implementation of the observer pattern with lists of observers and lists of, lists of, of, of subjects. The nice thing about this is this completely reusable version of the observer pattern, which reads exactly like the, the story in the Goff book. Uh, here's another one. This is an accessibility finite state machine. The power of this example is to show you that you could write aspects first. Because this just says, well, what has this finite state machine work? Well, there's three states. It starts out initialized. There's some authenticate operations and some access operations. If I return normally from authenticate, I become authenticated. If I return with an exception from authenticate, I become rejected. And before any access, I better be authenticated. It basically shows that you can do prototype-based development with aspects in advance of the other code being there, because you could just think this way. And I'm going to wrap up. I'll just say one thing here. There's lots of examples of this uh, for other languages and special frameworks and dot, 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 dot.
You guys asked a bunch of questions, so that's great, but we ran out of time. I'll say a quick thing about business strategy, and I'll tell you why the logging story is so important. When we first demoed Aspect J for the WebSphere team, the thing that got them was when the business analyst said, so this means that we could sell different qualities of logging for different prices? <laughs> the point here is that, I don't know if this works for you guys, because you guys are kind of different, but the point here is that this is a modularity technology. And if you want to think about it in strategic terms, the question to ask is, what can I modularize now that I couldn't modularize before? And that's what they were thinking. Right? They were thinking, I can sell different qualities of WebSphere to different people for a different price point. There's this really wonderful book by these two economists from Harvard Business School that's worth reading on that subject. There's a ton of other, other resources. There's a wonderful book here by Nick. There's a whole website. I will send you these slides so you can get these links off of it. He's telling me I have to stop. Roughly speaking, this idea of cross-cutting modular functionality, when used properly, makes your code cleaner, makes your code modular, makes your code look more like the thing you were trying to say in the first place. What these guys are worried about here is that used improperly, it could be a disaster, and that's true. But used properly, it makes code a lot better. Um, um, and so it's worth playing with. And if nothing else, it makes programs just look a lot better and makes me feel better about writing them. So I'll stop there. <laughs>